The majority opinion will be authored by the most senior member of the court, and that is Justice Clarence Thomas. And I suspect that Justice Roberts doesn't want Thomas to write what would cl- I suspect would be Makes a sense. barn burner opinion. Here's the $64,000 question. Will the United States Supreme Court overturn Roe versus Wade? And if they do, what will that mean for the legalization of abortion? And how will the Biden administration react? We have the answers today. Activist Radio, the Mark Harrington Show, is brought to you by Created Equal, and you can support our ministry and the radio program by going to MarkHarringtonShow.com. That's MarkHarringtonShow.com, and you can pick up the program on all the popular podcasting platforms. And if you would, please like and share the program so more people become aware of it as we spread the word about life and liberty. Today on the program, I have as my guest Dr. Francis Beckwith, and he is the professor of philosophy and church-state studies at Baylor University. He's also the author of several books, uh, Some of them we use here at Created Equal to train our young people. One of them is entitled Defending Life. Uh, He also wrote Politically Correct Death way back in the day. And he has a newer book which deals with the issue of uh, religious freedom entitled Taking Rights Seriously. Dr. Becca, thanks for being on the program. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, I wanted to bring you on and and discuss, you know, abortion in general, but Roe versus Wade specifically. And then I'd like to get your take on the Dobbs case. And if we have some extra time, I'd like to talk about some of these threats to religious freedom that we're seeing uh, pop up all across the country with this cancel culture. So let's start out. You know, a lot of people listening to the sound of my voice and my radio program are very familiar with Roe versus Wade, but there are some that, that aren't. Uh, and, and as we look back now, and with the possibility, I hope, maybe, that Roe's going to be overturned, there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding Roe. Uh, what would you say one of the main things about Roe that is misunderstood by the American people? I, I think w- one thing that's, that's misunderstood is the radicalness of the conclusions that the Supreme mm-hmm. Court drew. Uh, a lot right. of people think of Roe v. Wade as a kind of moderate opinion that simply allows abortion very early in pregnancy, and then later on the state or the local government can require all sorts of important reasons to allow abortion. But as a matter of fact, Roe v. Wade permits abortion for the entirety of pregnancy with very few restrictions being permitted in the last trimester. In fact, the court doesn't even consider the fetus to be a person constitutionally until it is born. So even though Mm -hmm. it permits some restrictions in the last trimester, it's not because the fetus is in fact a person. It's because it's a potential person or the state's interest increase or something along those lines. Well, as we all know, the uh, the U.S. Supreme Court kind of made up the uh, right to abortion. They founded it in the so-called right to privacy. If you would uh, give us a little background on how that evolved uh, and got to the place where the U.S. Supreme Court began the first hearing of the case, which was in 1971. That's right. So there was a, an earlier Supreme Court case in the early ni- mid-1960s called <clears throat> excuse me, Griswold v. Connecticut. And it was a case yeah. that overturned a Connecticut uh, anti-contraception law. It forbade uh, people to, I believe, buy and sell and even use contraception. Uh, it turns out, though, that the Supreme Court winds up reasoning in order to overturn it uh, by saying that there's in the Constitution an implied right of privacy. And so even if you think, like a lot of people think, that the law in Connecticut was a bad law, the Supreme Court went further than that. They said that the Constitution itself implies a, a privacy, a sanctity to the marital bed that uh, government cannot intrude in. And, and again, it's, it's an idea that on one level seems to be almost commonsensical, right? Mm-hmm, but, right. but this principle, though, winds up get, having a life of its own. The court eventually 
extends this right of privacy to not just married couples, to, but to single people uh, who are unmarried. This is a case called Eisenstadt, a Massachusetts case in the early 70s. And then from there, it extends it to the right to abortion. And it mm -hmm. does so by saying that abortion is, in a sense, merely an exercise of the same reproductive liberty that was protected in Griswold versus Connecticut. Of course, the problem, Mark, is with abortion is it's not simply an act that involves two parties uh, that are trying to prevent conception. It involves a third party, an unborn human being, and this court mm -hmm. simply does not adequately deal with that, that, that question. Who and what is this unborn human being? And when they confront the counter argument by the state of Texas, who was the uh, defendant in Roe v. Wade, they simply say that experts disagree about when life begins. So the court at this time in the evolution of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate. I think I almost got the whole thing right in terms of the quote, but yeah. so they simply dismiss it. It's a, they hand wave it away. And right. you know, some, some of the private correspondences between the justices reveal that there were even justices that voted with Roe that were uneasy with that move. They thought that the court should have actually made some kind of judgment. Well, you know, it's Harry Blackman who wrote the majority position, and he said that the difficult question of when life begins is not to be decided by the Supreme Court and, of course, sidestepped that question altogether. You know, we can look back and give them a little bit, maybe a benefit of the doubt because they didn't have the technology that we have today. But it's very clear. We all know when life begins and any noted embryologist would. Uh, and, and this is true across the board, really. They all believe that life begins at conception. So that, that's really a settled issue now, for sure. Uh, it may not have been back in 1973. And maybe we can give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt there. But mm -hmm. the fact that they didn't even tackle that question tells you uh, that they weren't really dealing with the heart of the issue. Uh, the right to privacy, which is not those words are not found in the U.S. Supreme or, or, or in the U.S. Constitution or Bill of Rights. We know that. Where are those found? I mean, they 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 found them in the penumbras. What were they? What did they mean? Yeah. So what the court did was uh, say something like this: that the Fourteenth Amendment says that one's life, li liberty, or property cannot be taken from one without due process of law. And then right. the Fourth Amendment, uh, uh, Fifth Amendment, you know, doesn't you can doesn't allow prosecutors to demand that someone um, testify against themselves. And the Fourth Amendment prevents unreasonable search and seizure. And so the court says, right. if we take all these, you know, okay. uh, there's this like yeah. there, there's an assumed right to privacy behind it. Now, I, I do want to be you know, fair to the court here. I don't think that way of reasoning is always entirely unreasonable. Uh, so for sure. example, something sure. like due process, the court, you know, the constitution doesn't define what due process is. We just know it because we inherited it from the common law. So it's, it's not entirely an unreasonable way to think. And I think at the time when Griswold was decided, nobody even in their wildest dreams would have anticipated it being applied to the right to abortion. My guest is Dr. Francis Beckwith. He's a professor of philosophy and church state studies at Baylor University. He's also an author. Uh, Dr. Beth, well, the the issue of relativism was founded, you know, in the in this in the middle of all this pro-abortion logic. That's really the heart of it all. How do we counter that? Yeah. So there's a sense in the abortion debate whenever people argue about it, they will say something like. Um, you don't have a right to force your moral views on me uh, right. or that may be your position, but it's not mine. And on, on one level, there's a certain truth to that, right? Yeah, people do disagree about mm -hmm. abortion and it, it implies a kind of relativism, right? That when it comes to moral questions, there is no objective right and wrong. But here's the problem with that thinking is that the person that supports abortion rights believes they're right. <laughs> They believe that their yeah. view is correct, and they and they also right. want the government and other taxpayers to support it. And so they must believe that it's good. Well, if they believe that it's good and that the entire community should support it, then they're not really relativists. They believe that there's a right moral view. So mm -hmm. I, I think this kind of appeal to a kind of popular relativism 
in a way impedes us from having a serious conversation in our culture about it, right? So if you if you can find ways to sort of hand wave people away, uh, and that's one of them, then people will in fact use that as a tactic. Uh, but it ultimately avoids the real hard questions about the nature of the unborn, the nature of what it means to be a human being. Well, it's interesting. Those who believe in relativism are generally the first to say that uh, <laughs> there are uh, there is a right and wrong. <laughs> they'll, they'll say you're wrong. <laughs> you know, they'll be the first to point out that your position isn't isn't correct. So they yeah. they actually are hypocritical on this anyway. They're they are absolutists at one level or another. Well, I, I will tell you a story. A couple of years ago, I was on a, a program like yours, and uh, it was a call-in program. And this gentleman called up, and he and he said, "The problem with you talking to me is that you think you're right and everybody else is wrong, and that makes you intolerant." <laughs> So I, I asked him immediately, I said, do you think I'm wrong in thinking that way? He said, yes. And I said, well, you're in precisely the same position as me. You think you're right and I'm wrong. Yeah. Now we can have a conversation, right? Exactly. Now that we know what where we stand. And it's it's really weird how, how people do that. <laughs> yeah. So I want to switch gears here and talk about Roe versus Wade. As we all know, the uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization cases right now before the U.S. Supreme Court. The opinions are being written. I mean, the, the, the most likely already decided, although if we if you look at the history of Roe v. Wade, there were changes late in the, that whole thing. So it's never over until the, the actual opinion is handed down. But and we're praying heavily here, you know, that they overturn Roe versus Wade. But let's talk about Dobbs versus Jackson. Why is it such a significant case? Are we overstating things when we are saying that? This is the closest we've come to overturning Roe versus Wade since uh, Casey. Oh, I don't think we're overstating it at all. And I think uh, there are certain clues when looking at both the content of the law in question as well as why the court took it. So the law basically restricts abortion. It, it prohibits abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Right. Now, uh, why is that significant? It's significant because in Casey versus Planned Parenthood, the case that upheld Roe that you mentioned a moment ago, mm -hmm. it says that the state only acquires an interest in significantly regulating abortion after viability or when right. the state can determine the viability of the fetus. That is the ability of the fetus to live outside the womb. The so at that time and today, 20 weeks is pretty, I mean, very few children can survive at 20 weeks, but some do. And so 20 weeks was, was in the opinion, kind of the, the lowest point at which the, the government can in any way restrict abortion for the sake of the unborn child. Mississippi says we're going to 15 weeks. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, there's no way to massage this. There's no, I mean, it's either... Casey gets overturned or, and Roe v. Wade by default or um, uh, or it doesn't. I mean, <laughs> right. And, and now, yeah, I want to get your take on that. I mean, there's three possibilities in my view. The first is that they overturn Roe versus Wade altogether, send it back to the states. The second is that they they uphold Roe and they strike down the 15 week ban altogether or they so, try to come up with some kind of middle ground, which I think is highly difficult to do. But. I, there are justices on the courts, a court, and I think Justice Roberts, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts, might be one of those who's trying to look for that middle ground. What What are your what's What's your thoughts on this? You know, I'm asking you to obviously make some predictions here, but we do have uh, some information to hopefully make a uh, an informed, I guess, opinion about what the court might do. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, 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 I think the middle ground option is is impossible. I mean, I, I've listened mm -hmm. to and read several uh, uh, works by friends of mine who are pro-life, who are who are legal scholars, uh, who know the court very well, one of whom actually has recently was a clerk on the court, and they just can't see any way around it. Now, one well, of the what, things... what kind of ideas do they have for middle ground? Not to go down there, but... Oh, okay. So, uh, so, so one... Yeah, I mean, ground... they're, they're, they're obviously well, just making things up as they're going if they do this. I mean, yeah, it's well, kind of like what Roe v. Wade was, but yeah, the they're not with... beyond doing that. 
Yeah, the problem right? with the middle ground, you know, that, you're right, but the problem with the middle ground is that the middle ground is going to have to be as bad as Roe v. Wade. Because remember, uh -huh. Roe v. Wade and Casey are, uh, at least the, even the Casey uh, plurality, uh, the Kennedy, O'Connor, Souter opinion, you can sense that they're not really comfortable that Roe v. Wade was even rightly decided, but they say, look, uh, we're kind of stuck with it because people have ordered their lives around. It. Yeah, they rely right? on it. Yes, that's right. This kind of reliance interest. So so we mm -hmm. we know that there's simply no confidence in, in the reasoning that gets us Roe v. Wade. But to get a replacement of Roe, you have to go at the court has to get into another expedition of making stuff up. And so it, it's either which is probably why they wouldn't want that. I mean, they've th had 49 exactly right. years of unsettled, really unsettled law. They'll say it's settled law, but it's not. I think it's, <laughs> it's been it's been very unsettled. That's honestly. right, and I think it's interesting. You know, uh, Texas, where I live, uh, has now I think it's what four months we've had. Uh, yeah, longer than that. It was last summer. That's right. So we've had restrictions on abortion, and it's yep. and the Supreme Court has refused to uh, issue an injunction to uh, to prevent the application of it. And abortion rates have decreased sixty percent. The That's sky right. hasn't fallen. And I think hundred babies a day they predict are being saved in Texas. And it's a start. So now the argument that you often would hear from from pro choice side on this, they would say, well, if abortion becomes illegal, then all these you know horrible things are going to happen. And well, we've had it now for a couple you know several months in in Texas. Yeah, and, and the world hasn't ended. <laughs> we're, right. we're we're that's doing right. okay. So what well, you 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 think it's going to be overturned? Give us your take on you know, kind of the inside baseball yeah. of how it might happen. So I think it's going to be overturned. Remember that 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 Dobson gets to the Supreme Court, not because a lower court upheld it, but a lower court actually said it was unconstitutional based on Roe and Casey. So That's right. usually the court doesn't, you know, would simply let that stand, right? If they thought That's that correct. Roe and Casey were good law, right? So the mm -hmm. fact that you have at least four justices, you need four for the court to accept the case. You have four justices who probably want to overturn Roe. Um, probably, I suspect there are five. And you mentioned Justice Roberts. Now, my sense is that uh, uh, that it will, if I had to predict, I think it's going to be six to three and Justice Roberts is going to write the majority opinion. And the reason for that mm -hmm. is that if mm -hmm. he does it, if he winds up going with uh, the, the the three uh, liberals on the court or decides to write a concurring opinion that agrees with not overturning Roe, uh, the majority opinion will be authored by the most senior member of the court, and that is Justice Clarence Thomas. And I suspect that Justice Roberts doesn't want Thomas to write what would cl I suspect would be makes a sense. barn burner opinion. That makes sense. That d definitely makes sense. So a 6-3 decision, Justice Roberts writes the majority position. Uh, boy, I hope you're right. <laughs> we're we're planning for it here, as many are across America for a post row America. This is how, you know, we have to get involved in our local and state governments to make sure that because uh, according to some of the uh, information out there, anywhere from 20 to 26 states could almost immediately ban abortion, which means we're going to have to be ready once this is overturned. Uh, Dr. Beckwith, we've got about two minutes left. I want to, I know it's not going to, this won't give us justice here, but I want to talk quickly about academic freedom and what's going on here. There's some breaking news that um, uh, Congressman Nadler, this isn't anything new to us, but he is asking Facebook to remove social media posts that involve the abortion pill reversal uh, you know <laughs> uh, I, I i'm i'm not shocked by this of course but we're seeing this across the board the cancel culture of the democrats liberals commonly doing this not just on pro-life cases but other cases uh if you would speak to that i know you have this book here ta uh, taking rights seriously if you would we've got about a minute just give us what you think about what's going on in the culture when it comes to that issue yeah it's it, Mark. It's, I think it's it's astonishing on one level because uh, there are those uh, of us who have who consider ourselves at least you know right of center who mm -hmm. affirm uh, you know th these fundamental rights and we've always felt that there was at least a sizable number, if not 
a vast majority of our liberal friends that would agree with us on a lot of these these questions of free speech, freedom of discourse, religious liberty. But now some of our liberal friends, not all of them, but many of them sound like, you know, kind of old fashioned Puritans. <laughs> they, they want to sort of excise from the public square anything that yeah. that's that descends from their their creed. It's in a way, if, if you want to say that they're they, they want an atheocracy rather than a theocracy. That is, they want a a, a, a kind of um, society that undermines or stands for a kind of unbelief. Well, it's interesting that they've said that uh, one of the reasons uh, Jared Nadler uh, cites for making, you know, or asking Facebook to do what they're going to do is because of public health. It's always, you know, it's post, you know, in the pandemic, it's all about so-called health and science, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll say that these uh, these websites dealing with the abortion pill reversal are not scientific. Uh, it's, it's fake news. They're lying, et cetera, et cetera. We all know. Um, that's usually the, uh, you know, the predicate they use to try to shut down speech. My guest has been Dr. Francis Beckwith, and you can go to francisbeckwith.com. That's francisbeckwith.com. He's written several books that I recommend heavily and highly. One is Defending Life. The other is on uh, this issue of freedom of speech and religious liberty it's called Taking Rights Seriously. That's rights, R-I-T-E-S, Taking Rights Seriously. Dr. Beckwith, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. So, friends, I need you to take action today, and you can do that in two ways. The first is go to MarkHarringtonShow.com and submit a comment. Just let us know what you think of the program. Uh, also, if you have a question or comment, leave that. For me to read, I'll read the comment or question on the air. If you have ideas for guests or subjects that you'd like to be covered here on the Mark Harrington Show, be sure to also let me know about that. You can find out, again, more at MarkHarringtonShow.com. The other thing is I'd like to make available to you the book Defending Life, which is written by my guest, Dr. Francis Beckwith. I think it's one of the best books written on pro-life apologetics. Very detailed and excellent. If you want to be an apologist on the pro-life issue, uh, Dr. Beckless' book, Defending Life, is one of the best. And you can get that by going to markharringtonshow.com and click on the donate link. And when you donate, just simply say in the comment section that you'd like the book, Defending Life, sent to you. For a gift of $50, that's $50 made out, or if you do it online, to create it equal, we'll send you Dr. Beckwith's book, uh, Defending Life. Again, go to MarkHarringtonShow.com, click on the donate link, uh, give us $50, and we'll send you the book by Dr. Francis Beckwith entitled Defending Life. In the time I have left, I want to just share some, uh, some breaking news. This happened last week. At the Ohio State University, which is right down the road here from our studios, there is a, a, a student organization which is having something called Sex Week, believe it or not. Sex Week. Hard to believe, but, you know, in today's world, I guess maybe it's not that hard to believe. But during this week, this group is going to be having talks about, and a lot of these I can't even say on the air, debunking abstinence-only sex education, gender-affirming uh, surgery information session, the ABCs of LGBTQ+, a queer history, safe queer swiping, great minds kink alive, let's talk about drag baby. I mean, I could go on, but the one that really stood out to me is they are going to write Valentine's cards to abortion providers, to abortionists. Now, when you think about that, it kind of makes sense. If you're going to have sex outside of marriage, if you're going to have sex with anyone you wish, whenever you want, then eventually, somewhere along the way, you might get a woman pregnant. And if you do, you need a backup, and that's abortion. So I could imagine why they would want to thank abortion providers, because abortion is simply birth control, really, uh, if if fail if if birth control fails, that is the pill or any other kind of chemical or device fails, they need abortion as a backup. 
And that's why in, during the sex week, they're going to be writing thank yous or Valentine cards to abortion providers. Let me say this. The 60s, the sexual revolution was supposed to be uh, brought about to bring women in equality with men. That was the point, right? That was the point of feminism, supposedly. Well, it did nothing of the sort. All it did was enslave women to men. Most uh, abortionists are men, and men get off the hook because they have abortion. They can have sexual relations with anyone they wish without responsibility. All they have to do is to refer them to have an abortion or pay for it. Abortion is not liberating to women. It simply enslaves them to men. And that's why they should not be thanking abortion providers, but it kind of makes sense. So this is the battle we have on college campuses day in and day out here at Created Equal. And I need you to continue to pray for us as we go to college campuses this semester. God bless you. God bless America. And remember America to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to make a difference for the cause of life, liberty, and justice, go to createdequal.org. To follow Mark, go to markharringtonshow.com. Be sure to tune in next time for your marching orders in the culture war.